Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, I'll call to order the Tabor Ad Hoc Committee meeting of Monday, April 11, 2022. Um, we're scheduled to go from 3 to 4 p.m. Uh, help via Zoom. And um, I want to note for the record that we have myself and uh, Director Broom, the, the co-chairs of the committee, but we also have several other board members. I'm just going to kind of read down in the order I see them. Director Geisinger, um, Director Tisdale, uh, Director Rivera Malpietti, uh, everybody's shifting around on me. Then uh, Director Tisdale is still there. Um, Director Williams, Director Sloan, Director Catlin, Director Lewis. And uh, did, I, if I, did I miss anybody among the board members? We also have uh, GM CEO, Deborah Johnson, General Counsel, Melanie Snyder, CFO Doug McLeod, uh, John McKay, Michael Davies, um, Barbara McManus, and um, Jillian Brady, Marie Snell, Mike Smith, Ty Shray uh, Parrish. Okay, um, so we'll proceed into the agenda. Uh, first up is discussion items and as Director Broom has noted, this is uh, we're starting our sessions as sort of uh, Tabor 101, kind of getting us all up to speed on the ins and outs, um, where we stand and so forth. And we thought we'd start with this key component of uh, Tabor Finance. It'll be presented by uh, Doug McLeod, our CFO. What I'd uh, note a couple of things. We had originally intended to have um, D. Weiser, our bond council present, but he was unable to make it. and. Um, as well, we may need to be able to tap the reimagined consultants who have done a bit of work on, on the taper provisions and the impacts um, possible to us. So we're going to have a second meeting to focus on the finance issues. That'll be the next meeting, correct, Doug, on May 9 at 3 p.m. And as we go through the slides, if you um, have questions, it may be that Doug will say, we can bring that to you next meeting. So feel free to add those. What I'd ask is that we go through um, the slide presentation, hold our questions, unless there's an immediate, you know, need to clarify that word or something, but generally speaking, hold your questions until the end and then, um, and then take those up. If you have questions that don't strictly, or ideas or thoughts, suggestions that don't strictly fall within this finance piece, I'll offer up the time in other matters for you to bring those up. And, um, and by way of introduction to both pieces, would encourage folks to ask the questions you need to, because I think it's critical that we all have a, a really good grounding in the issues associated with this, because we'll all be um, important communicators and ambassadors on the issue. Uh, Director Broom, do you have anything to add at this point before I turn it over to Doug? No, I don't think so. I think we need to just jump in and get going. Okay, let's go. Uh, turning it over to you, Doug. Uh, thank you, Chair Cook and Chair Broom. Uh, so yeah, as you mentioned, this is intended to be a very basic uh, refresher on some of the Tabor concerns that RTD has. Uh, I am by no means a Tabor expert. Um, Melanie, General Counsel Melanie Snyder and our Government Relations Officer Michael Davies are here to assist me in trying to field some of the questions, but they may be out of our scope. And so we ask that uh, you give us, give us those questions and we can do the research hopefully um, with D Wiser and bring those back as you mentioned. So without further ado, I will share my screen. All right, hopefully you can see my screen. Not yet. Presentation? No. Okay, great. All right, as mentioned, this is an introduction to the Taxpayer's Bill of Rights. So just uh, some quick basic points on this. I only have nine slides, so it's very basic, but- um, uh, Doug, we still don't see your screen. Sorry about that. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me try again here. How about now? Yes. Okay, great. Yes, thank but you. it's not in presentation mode, Mr. McLeod. Thank you, General Manager Johnson. How about there you now? Are. <laughs> All right, now, now we've got it right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, introductory slide here. Um, so in 1992, the 
state of Colorado passed a cost constitutional amendment, uh, amendment 10 to the Colorado constitution, which required um, voter approval for any new taxes, tax increases or debt issuance. So it's the main intent of TABOR, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, is to limit government revenue collection and spending. Um, there's some terminology that we'll go through today, including the ratchet down. So there's some impacts that really affect RTD and we'll get a little bit more into specifics as how, how this affects RTD, but it affects every government agency within Colorado, whether it be a state uh, agency or the state itself or um, municipalities, uh, special districts, et cetera. We're all subject to these TABOR limitations. Um, so ratcheting down is the potential to reduce revenue collections. For us, revenue collections, our most significant revenue collection that would be impacted would be uh, sales and use tax collections, which as the board knows, comprises about two thirds of our collection. So probably compared to most other agencies, um, that's a little bit different than what they're used to. They have many different sources of revenue. They have property taxes, et cetera. For RTD, our primary uh, revenue source is sales and use taxes, which would be subject to TABOR. Uh, revenue limitations. You also hear the term debrucing, and that comes from the author of this legislation, this constitutional amendment, Douglas Bruce. So debrucing means that you are not subject to certain limitations of TABOR for a period of time, and that has to be voter approved as well. So you hear that term debrucing. If you're debruced, you don't have to follow the, for a, a designated period of time, you do not, uh, are not subject to the, the limitations of TABOR. So what does that mean for RTD? So RTD has two voter approved tax collections. Uh, we collect a total of 1% on certain sales with, and uses of assets within the district. There is a base system sales tax and a fast track sales tax. Together they combine the uh, amount to 1%. The base system is 0.6%. And the base system is debruced, so it's not subject to TABOR growth, revenue growth limitations um, uh, up until 2025, actually. So we pay off the debt. The way the TABOR works essentially is we have, um, we've gotten voter approval to be debruced on the base system through 2026. However, because our debt will be paid off in 2024, we, have, we don't have the ability to, uh, the voter approval to issue additional debt, nor do we have the ability to uh, remain debruced once that debt has been repaid under the provisions of that extension. So in 2024, our debt will be paid off. All the bonds will be paid off on the base system side. Those outstanding bonds have to do with the T-REX project, the T transportation expansion plan, which expanded I-25 and added the Southeast rail line. Um, those bonds will be paid off in 2024, which means beginning in 2025, we're subject to those uh, revenue growth limitations. I'll, and I'll get into a little more detail on what that might look like. On fast tracks, in 2004, the voters approved fast, the fast tracks expansion project, which authorized a four tenths sales tax, in addition to the six tenths, uh, where, how, which is how we arrived at the 1.0% sales tax. On the fast track side, they're debruced, that funding, the four tenths is debruced through 2050. And again, that's due to the, the bonding, the bonds not being paid off on the fast track side until 2050. And thereby at that point in time, beyond that fast tracks, the four tenths would be subject to revenue growth limitations under TABOR as well. Um, we've had discussions um, with the board about the remaining bonding, remaining bonding authority on the fast track side. That TABOR authorization is expected to expire fairly soon. Uh, so that in addition to the 2050 extension are some limitations on the 410 side. I think I should also just mention that uh, currently the base system funding can be used to fund fast tracks, but not vice versa. Voters authorize that four tenths only to be spent on fast track. So we have to keep those two pieces of funding separate and we account for it in that manner. So in 2025, the base system is subject to TABOR revenue limitations. And here's a, a quick quote here. If revenue from sources not excluded from fiscal year spending exceed these limits in dollars for that fiscal year, the excess shall be refunded. That's a quote from uh, the TABOR amendment. 
So what that means for RTD, and you've probably heard for many um, government agencies, it's consumer price index change plus the change in population. For RTD, it's just a little bit different. We're also, we are subject to consumer price index inflation changes plus the change in property tax values as opposed to change in population, which is more applicable to the state. So the sum of those two, if the combined of those two year over year is 3% and our revenue grows 4%, we can only keep 3% and return the, the excess 1%. And just keep in mind that this is only on the base system side because uh, the fast tracks side has that Tabor exemption through 2050. So when you see these numbers here in a couple of slides, we're really only talking about in the near term, it's gonna be the base system that's going to be impacted for RTD. Uh, the term ratchet down. So this is where it becomes very restrictive for RTD and our future revenue collections on the taxes for the base system. So what happens with the ratchet down? That term is, and this term was coined in Florida where they also have a, a similar Tabor uh, law in place. Uh, to limit spending and uh, revenue growth of governments. So what happens is if we have a recession and our, our sales and use taxes decline in any given year, that sets a new baseline for RTD. And then we can only grow to the extent of CPI plus uh, property tax growth that next year. We don't get to go back up to where we were if we have a, a really good recovery and then start from there. And that's where it gets ratcheted down. It sets a new baseline. So because we're already limited on the top end, how much we can grow, we're now also uh, forced to lower our baseline so we can only grow from that base back up going forward. And you'll see a slide here in a few minutes that really demonstrates that when we went through the last recession and what that impact would look like. So a couple um, important points is that the lower revenue in one year becomes the base for growth in the next year. And it can be several years before we return to uh, where we were pre um, that before that dip actually occurred in our revenue. So it could be several years when we're uh, having to reduce our expenditures or find other revenue sources to make up for that difference. So this slide is a demonstration of what would have happened if the Tabor growth limitate revenue growth limitations would have been in place at the last recession in 2008 and 2009. And we're focusing just on the base system side here, just to give a perspective of what could potentially happen in 2025 and going forward if we had a similar recession or decrease in our sales and use tax collections in any given year. So what you can see is the blue line is what our actual results were. There were no Tabor growth limitations at that point in time. So going through 2008 and 2009, we had a, a recession and we lost about 10% of our uh, sales and use tax collections uh, from the prior years. So we dipped down a little bit and then we recovered fairly quickly and we were back within, I believe it was four or five years, we were back to where we were prior to the recession. The orange line demonstrates what would have happened if the Tabor revenue growth limitations would have been in place. So as you can see, it would have really curtailed our ability to grow our revenues back. And we certainly wouldn't have recovered to the actual extent um, that, that the returns, the uh, tax collections actually returned uh, during that period. So that gap between the blue line and the orange line is the difference in, in the two scenarios. So fortunately we were in the blue scenario but we could have been in the orange scenario of Tabor had to, had to, had to have been in place for the, the base system. And that total difference through 12 years, just up through 2019, because we don't have the, all the data we need for the Tabor growth limitations for 20 and 21 yet, but just for those 12 years, it would have amounted to less revenue to the tune of $647.7 million. On, and that's just the base system. So I think you can see from that, it's, it's a pretty big number. It's a pretty big impact from that ratcheting down in those taper growth limitations. So I'll just stop there and we can go to questions here in a few minutes. Um, from a financial perspective, obviously this is quite concerning. And from RTD's perspective, it's quite concerning because it limits our ability to possibly fund our transit services. And we're really subject to the whims of the economy. Given that our uh, sales and use tax is two thirds of our revenue source, it's very significant for us that we would be subject to this possibility. So some of the things that we discussed internally were 
um, it's virtually a certainty that this will happen unless we don't have any decreases in revenue at any point in time. Um, we won't be, we, we wouldn't be subject to the ratchet down, but it's more than likely that we'll have that ratcheting down effect resetting the baseline. But for sure, we'll be subject at some point where we have, let's say, very good economic growth, but our, our CPI plus our um, change in property tax values is less than that. So we would always be limited to stay at that level. We could never take advantage of a, a very high performing economy that exceeds those two measurements. So when we look at our financials and the forecast going forward, there's what we've been fortunate to have is to be debruced on both the base system and the fast track. So that's given us a lot of budget certainty. Now we have a lot of um, changes in our forecast because nobody can really see the future, but at least we, aren't, we don't have that additional limitation that we're subject to. So it's given us somewhat of, of an ability to have some budget certainty. So some of the options that, that um, I know everybody's discussed is we have the possibility to debruce. Um, but that would require voter approval. Any change basically to this outlook for our, our Tabor being subject to Tabor on the base system as well as fast tracks in the future requires voter approval. Um, if we were to do something that right sized um, our ability to continue to collect taxes to whatever extent that may look like, we think it would also be wise to possibly attempt to combine the six tenths and the four tenths into one because we're all one company. Um, Fast tracks is no longer fast tracks versus base in our perspective and uh, maintaining operations in an entire transit system. So we think it would be um, a good thing if we could combine the two into one single tax if, if we were to take any action with voter approval. Another opportunity possibly, and we've looked at this many times in the past, and RTD's enabling legislation limits our ability to do certain things in, in terms of tax collections. But if we could diversify our revenue sources, that might be a possible solution. Again, another big hurdle. But the fact that two thirds of our revenues are dependent on one type of revenue stream really subjects us to the whims of the economy. And then finally, I think a solution, that you, one of the things that we've kind of discussed a little bit too is whatever RTD decides to move forward with from a financial perspective, I think it would be wise that if we're going to um, go down the path of looking at voter authorization or some other mechanism to try to mitigate the impacts of Tabor, we should also have a backup plan, I believe, some kind of um, plan B in case that first plan doesn't pan out, or if we need some kind of conservative uh, way to approach the future. And that might be to modify our fiscal policy to really look at what are our reserves. Um, our reserves can help get us through those, those rough patches. We've used them in the past. We've gone through recessions and other unexpected uh, downfalls in our revenues. So that might be another option for the board to consider as well um, as sort, somewhat of a plan B or maybe just a good practice in, in our fiscal policy. And uh, Chair Cook, that is my final slide and we'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, um, okay, uh, so we've got 40 minutes left and that leaves us some time, I think, for, for everybody to ask questions. Uh, some things he may need, uh, Doug may need to bring back or Melanie. Um, so I have a, a hand up, first of all, by Director Williams, please go. Thank you, Chair Cook. Um, I'm just wondering if we could have the same presentation to our uh, local legislators like maybe to a Dr. Cog board meeting or something? Is that a question for me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's oh. a question and I think Thanks. for everybody. Um, is that something that we could look at and should look at soon? Certainly we'd be willing to put together whatever the board desires um, and present to other parties as well, as long as General Manager Johnson's okay with that. General Manager Johnson, sorry, I think I jumped ahead of you there. Yeah, no, you didn't. Fine. Not, not, no, you're fine. I was just gonna share in light of this presentation and Director Sloan was in attendance at the Metro Mayor's Caucus just last Wednesday when I gave a presentation and I made reference to this ad hoc committee that the chairman had convened and said the first meeting would be today. 
and that this was something that the board was looking at collectively. So I would just say if it's the board desire for us as we go forward, as we talk about community value, getting back to our strategic priority, this is something staff would be more than willing to do if that's the desire of the board. So I just wanted to add that in since I did dip my toe in the water just last Wednesday by sharing this information was forthcoming. So I'll add a thought here. I think it's really critical and glad you brought it up. I, I think it will be wise to develop a, an, a communications approach. I mean, a whole uh, program um, in order to identify uh, the, the key stakeholders and groups that we want to be sure are on board. And so rather than um, start off and just go immediately to Metro mayors, I would, I would like to see what you all think about um, coming up with a, a communications plan that we implement as we go through this process. Director Broom. I wonder if we could get uh, copies of the original legislation that differentiates between cities and RTD as it pertains to the assessed valuation as being a factor. So uh, there's actual wording in uh, section 20 that modified um, the constitution with regard to the taxpayer's bill of rights. Is that what you're talking about, Director Broom? Yes. Yeah. Doug McLeod or Melanie Snyder, can you get that to us? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's a good idea. Anything else, Doc, uh, Director Broom? Oh, you're on mute. Still on mute. Let's go. I'm sorry, Director Broom, you're still on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, no, I don't have anything else. You were talking a lot there. <laughs> so um, what do you think about the idea that uh, Director Williams had? Had we ought to proceed now with uh, getting information out there as we get it? Or do you want to, to come up with a, a plan that we work on with the communications folks? Or what's your thought there? Well, I think it, it doesn't hurt to alert Dr. Cog that we're working on this, um, but it may, we should maybe wait a couple months until we have a little bit more feel for exactly where we're headed. Director Williams, you good with that? Others? Yeah, I just wanna point out that um, this information is something that we need to share uh, above and beyond this committee and above and beyond the board. And the sooner and the louder, the better. That's my feeling on it. Director Tisdale. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I agree with the idea that we need to engage uh, Dr. Cog, Metro Mayors, uh, Colorado Counties Incorporated, uh, the rest uh, to be able to get the message across. But I also agree with Director Broom that uh, to some extent, rather than just throwing information, we need to start channeling and we need to start having a sense of what is it that we will be asking at the end of the day. I don't know that we have to have a completely formulated ask now, but I think that uh, if we just say, boy, look at this, this is really something, we could have other people start formulating solutions for us with which we might not totally agree. So I'm uh, agreeing with the concept of the communication, but suggesting that it does take some formulation first, and I think staff can provide some assistance in that, uh, and particularly with some uh, updated and enhanced projections to show where we are. Because obviously as to four tenths of a cent, we aren't impacted for uh, 28 years. So needless to say, we aren't going to get a whole lot of sympathy on that because uh, we do have the debrucing in place there. We face a very current situation very urgently relative to the six tenths because <clears throat> that's something that fumes much earlier. I would like to know, however, 
when we make these projections, have we taken into account uh, looking forward? Let us assume, for the sake of argument, that 2025 uh, we are deep roost. I'm sorry, we are no longer deep roost as to the base system, and uh, Tabor fully kicks in. However, <clears throat> if we're looking at CPI plus increase in property valuations, that's actually a pretty high percentage. Uh, I mean, as it stands right now, if we're going to maintain, I, I hope we don't, but uh, I, I think many members on this board have often said we need to take the most conservative approach when looking at financial numbers. Let us take, therefore, 7% CPI and carry that out for the next three years uh, and say, you know, what, what if that were to continue on for a number of years after that? What does that do to our projections? So it would be beneficial if we had some insight. Now, that may be a question that we have to pose to uh, the Leeds school and get their input on where they think things are coming. Uh, are, we have not had a presentation from them in a while. Did we get, because don't we get it in the spring and the fall, Doug, from uh, uh, the Leeds school? Yes, in fact, tomorrow night they'll be giving an update on their uh, sales and use tax presentation for March. Well, how do you like that? If I'd looked at my packet, I would have known that. <laughs> that, that that's, that's good. But I'm not on that committee, so I, I look at it later than I might otherwise. Um, all right, well, that'll be helpful, I think, in, in looking at some of these uh, questions. And I had another question, too. Uh, our enabling statute gives us the right to assess a property tax. Uh, and uh, we have never done that. And I have raised in the past the question of, well, have we ever thought about going to the voters and saying, let's do a property tax. This might be more palatable to a lot of people who uh, pay in terms of, look at the sheer number of voters, who pay less property tax or who are renters and don't feel a direct sense of paying property tax, and could we convince them? And in the past, I have received an answer to that that essentially on the part of staff shut it down. But I will say that the answer must not have been that compelling to me because I can't currently recall what the answer was that was given to me. So uh, perhaps at some point, if we looked at what would it be like to uh, explore imposing a property tax on the district, uh, I think that might be a reasonable part of the discussion. Because you do say, for example, look at alternative sources of revenue. That's obviously one of them. Those are my comments for right now, Madam Chair and Mr. Chairman. So I thank you. OK. Um, OK, let's proceed. Uh, Director Rivera Mappietti. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, I think this is a great conversation to have. And as I recall, when we did have an evaluation done on whether or not RTD could get another voter tax imposed, it was um, increasingly high of no, no way, no. Um, I guess I'm not feeling like the voters are ready to increase tax anymore. I think people are really fatigued with taxing as it is. Um, I'm very excited about the information that's been presented. And I think that tying it to the strategic plan is exactly what we have put into place. What I would like to see is a strategic timeline layout of how we disseminate information and to whom we disseminate information. I think that this is a community-wide engagement conversation not just elected officials, because it will impact the entire district. And I, I cannot stress enough um, the whole piece around community engagement being um, integral to the success of us disseminating this information and not getting some pretty serious blowback. Thank you, ma'am. Are you, I guess for clarification there, um, are you suggesting community engagement now as a way to identify the path forward or community engagement once we have an idea of the sort of direction we want to move? Or Yeah, I think we need to really kind of um, 
lay out the strategy on this and then start assigning where it is we feel like we need to move forward for it to be uh, transparent, inclusive, and successful for, for the whole district. Okay. Are you suggesting also polling or had we done polling, Madam? Um, well, I was thinking of uh, General Manager Johnson, CEO Johnson. You had mentioned the idea of polling. Is that something that has been underway or are you just uh, talking about the need for that soon or what's your thinking there? So thank you so much, Director Cook. Um, and just for everyone's edification, when we uh, have this conversation, I was suggesting that polling is important so we can gauge our path forward, but we needed to be clear about the direction in which this body was gonna take. So until we're clear about what it is that we need to poll upon based upon your objectives, we're more than willing to lean into that. And I do think it would be advantageous to outline a strategic communication strategy that clearly outlines the objectives, um, our key audiences, the tactics that we would like to leverage because that will inform the decision holistically. Exactly my point. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Director Cook and Director Rivera Malpietti. Anything else, Director Rivera Malpietti? Okay. I'm good. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Director Geisinger. Thanks very much. Um, I agree with uh, a lot of what's being said. Um, thanks, Doug, for uh, coming up with kind of these three starter options. We've talked about a debrucing, which, you know, of course, is not increasing the tax, but it's letting us keep um keep the excess and and i think as your um well it, it, i'm not sure if it was in your slideshow but many of them but in most small governments local governments and school boards and others in the state have been able to accomplish that although jefferson county was most recently not able to but um that's certainly sort of top of mind uh the other two that you mentioned the combining the 0.6 percent and 0.4 percent and diversifying the revenue sources, I think, um, you know, fall into what what the others have just said is, you know, how do we move this forward? I know that the uh, reimagine consultants have done some work on that on this. Have they done any work at looking at those options? Uh, thank you for the question. They did do a little bit of work. They engaged with a, a firm called uh, EPS, and uh, I know they had put together. Uh, some some of the data that I had on that slide uh, actually came from their report. There was a report that they completed, I believe it was about a year ago, so it might be a little bit stale, but let me see what they've got and uh, we can follow up with that as well, if that's okay. Great, thanks. And then just to be sure I understand, I, I, I'm putting this in a way that, that um, a big threat is to our revenues and to, to engaging in this downturn and the ratcheting and the, um, and the loss of sales taxes, if there's a downturn in the real estate market. Is that, am I understanding that right? Yes, correct. That, that would limit our growth, certainly. And, you know, one of the things I'm not too clear on myself as not being a Tabor expert is I believe it applies to all taxes. So, you know, I'd want to get some clarification speaking with Melanie later as well as D Wiser, you know, if we implement a property tax, I'm not sure if that's also subject to that same uh, Tabor, those same Tabor growth limitations. So while we might be able to expand our revenue base, we might need to be very cautious about what that revenue base looks like because it may just get us right back where we started anyhow. Right, good point. Okay, thank you. Okay, Dr. Kalman. Um, Thanks, I, I think my question got answered. I was really wondering more about polling and kind of gauging the temperature now of the of the um, voters and then if we were to do some sort of based on that polling do some sort of outreach that addressed some of those issues then we could see how effective our outreach efforts were um, as we move forward so i i appreciate what um, gm ceo johnson said about the possibility of polling that's all I had. Thanks. Thank you, Director Broom. Yeah, you know, when most uh, entities, when they go to the voters to approve uh, a new tax or an increase, they automatically put provisions in there to do Bruce so they don't have that problem in the future. And I guess the other question I have is, do we have any kind of a scorecard as to of all the entities that are in RTD, how many of them have de -Bruced? 
are we in Jefferson County, the Lone Rangers, or is it half and half, or or just what is the feeling, or you know what is what would the data show? Yeah, uh, Doug or Melanie or anybody? Sure, we can see what we can put together. I know D has some, D Weiser has some uh, history and some knowledge just off the top of his head, but we'll see what kind of records we can come up with to provide that to this uh, committee. Okay. Um, Director Williams, or excuse me, Director Brown, are you, is that it? Uh, I think I had one more, but I can't remember what it was, but thanks. I'll come back to you. Sorry about that. Director Williams? Um, so I, I, I think that we ought to discuss how many people in this room actually believe that anybody in the RTD district that was asked to support a tax to support us right now would do it. I mean, you know, we are not beloved, unfortunately, we need to go there. And that's why I feel so strongly that what transit transportation is a huge issue in greenhouse gas and our brown cloud and it's a big topic right now and if we would let people know that it's you know they don't have to support rtd or love rtd but that if they don't make some moves um to support us fiscally that they're not going to be supporting all of the greenhouse gas and climate change efforts and and we need to say that you know now soon loud often um, because can you imagine, I don't know, anybody in this room say, hey, we're going to go ask Boulder to give us some more money. I mean, <laughs> they're going to fall out of there. People are screaming now that they haven't gotten what they paid for in tax dollars for years. And, and we would say that we want them to give us more. I, I, that's inconceivable to me. Um, anyhow, that's just how I feel about it. Sorry, guys. Yeah, there's a, the flip side might be that uh, there is great recognition of the constraints we're facing right now. Um, at, at a prior meeting, I think uh, GM CEO Johnson had said, um, while the bar might be high, and that's what's been shown in the past, uh, without some data, we don't really know the ins and outs, the nuances of the opinions about us and so forth. So um, I, I understand and probably would agree with you, but wouldn't go there in a blanket fashion at this point, I guess is what I'd say for myself. Director Geisinger? Yeah, um, I agree with, with what you're saying. And, uh, you know, I certainly hear what Director Williams is saying. And, and uh, you know, I think another way to, uh, another approach way to think about this is, you know, how we might empower our local governments and work with them if, uh, um, if they have fundraising capacity or others, you know, the state, um, because, you know, I agree, this is all about uh, trying to achieve, to move people um, to, it, as our strategic plan says, you know, make our connections to moving people in, and also about achieving a lot of the region's goals in terms of, uh, of environmental and other goals. Director Williams, did you have anything on, on that same discussion, a little bit of back and forth here? Yeah, I, I, I understand that we need to um, get our act together before we go to speak to the public and particularly to our um, peers and, and, and Dr. Cog and other um, county government officials. But I would just like to see us do that rapidly. That's all. I, I don't necessarily think that we need to leave here today with this wonderful slide deck that, that Doug gave us. That is reasonable, but I think that we need to soon um, put together a campaign and make this uh, public record. Uh, Director Rivera Malfietti. Thank you, Madam Chair. The only thing that I keep thinking about is that we are in a major um, re-election and campaigning mode right now for the statewide election in November and then the municipal, at least in the city and county of Denver next May. And people are fundraising uh, frantically. Th that's really ramping up. And that's why I think it's so crucial for us to put together a strategic timeline as the general manager CEO has outlined, it's crucial 
um, making sure that as we move forward, that we're really thinking things through, including the diversity of the district that we need to reach out to. I think it's going to take a real um, grassroots campaign because uh, I absolutely agree. You know, not everybody loves RTD, but we are in a unique um, place right now with climate change and that is looming over us and that really transit is the number one component that can really impact our climate. And we need to get the endorsement and the support of the entire region to move it forward. Thank you. Director Lewis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. McLeod, I'm curious, have you all done any um, projections or workups on what the district might look like in 2025? or could rather? Um, you know, what we have done, the only thing that we've done based on limited information that we have um, to project things like a recession, um, even our, our forecasters, our sales and use tax forecasters at CU Leeds do not project uh, recessions. They kind of build them into their long-term uh, forecasts. Uh, so what we did with the midterm financial plan that we brought to the board in October last year is we limited the sales and use tax growth on the base system side to just 1% in years 2025 through 2027, just to kind of tamper that down a little bit. What that doesn't allow for, I mean, it's conservative, but what it doesn't allow for is if we hit a recession in, say, 2024 and we set that new baseline, we get ratcheted down, it would pull everything down in the future along with that. So. Yes and no, it's just really hard. We can do several different scenarios. Um, it's just the degree to which that hits us and when it when it might hit us is the question. Director Lewis, is that what you meant uh, by what the district might look like? Yeah, um, I actually had a kind of, I have a follow-up and uh, Mr. McLeod might answer it um, in terms of service. So I'm, I'm curious as to what the district could potentially look like in terms of increase or decrease in service. General Manager Johnson, do you want to speak? Yeah, I was going to, if I may. Um, so recognizing the whole notion behind the reimagine RTD is a multi-pronged approach as we talk about where we would be, and this is the comprehensive operational analysis, right? And while we have the system optimization plan, as we look at the mobility plan for the future, we're taking all those things into considerations as we deduce what might we look like based upon you know, development, what's happening in reference to major employment sites and things along those lines. And so working in tandem quite naturally, having an understanding as we look at Dr. Cog's long, long range planning as well, that will enable us to project what the district potentially could look like, but we'd be remiss not to factor in, how do you fund those services going forward if in fact you don't have the financial resources in order to optimize your transit network and ensure that there's service readily available to get to those places that may be in the development stages as we go forward. Thank you, that's helpful. You're and welcome. Uh, one more, one more question. I know we've had a, a few convers. We've had a, a number of directors chime in about um, increased taxes, but that that's not necessarily the only thing on the table that we're potentially exploring. I I, I thought on the slides that there was some discussion about um, uh, having the 0.6 percent and the 0.4 percent um, go into a one percent, and that could be something that would be beneficial to RTD. Or did I miss? Did I misunderstand that? Yeah, I, I, oh, sorry, Chair, may I go? Yeah, I think th that was just some off the cuff ideas, Director Lewis. And, you know, I think there's a, a whole host of different um, possibilities depending on what direction the board wants to take. Um, combining those two and asking to, to combine the six tenths into the four tenths and get DeBruce through 2050 is a, an option possibly. I think it's just, it's gonna take somebody with more expertise than me in the political landscape as to what has a chance of passing because that too would have to go to the voters. But yeah, we have, we can we can ask them to approve whatever makes the most sense for this agency. So there are a number of options on the table, or there could be rather. Yes. Okay, uh, I really appreciate it. I, I will say at least in the conversations that I've had with folks about transit, um, about RTD specifically, I know we hear a lot, off, we hear very often from folks who are very upset with RTD um, as it pertains to the service, 
but I would say of folks who actually utilize our services that they that they that I've had enough conversation with folks who would actually increase taxes if it were to fund a transit system and if we were able to show them what the vision for RTD is in the future and the future of mobility that they would absolutely fund that. And so I don't say that for you to answer to uh, Mr. McLeod, but maybe for other directors as well to say that, you know, the conversation is a bit more expansive than those who might have more access to us um, or who have um, probably more access to us um, and who, who tend to have louder voices that they, there are some folks who who believe in transit, who want to save the planet and, and are willing to do what they need to do to, to make that happen. Anything else, Director Lewis? Nothing else, thank you. Um, Director Tisdale. Thank you very much. Uh, to go back to one of the questions that was asked earlier about uh, who has deep roots, at least as of three years ago, um, 174 out of the 178 school districts have deep roost. 85% of our municipalities have deep roost and 51 of our 64 counties have deep roost. <clears throat> so it, it's a popular thing to do. And obviously we did a, a very good job of it with fast tracks, but less so with uh, the base system. Combining them, the, the point four and the point six, doesn't really of course solve the issue. We still have to go to a vote in order to get that deep roosting of the 0. 0.6 to apply to, I mean, of the 0. 0.4 to apply to the 0. 0.6. Um, that's something that just no matter what, we're going to get it. And, uh, you know, we'll have to see. There's a question relative to the timing, though, that I was also trying to find an answer on because I should know this, but I can't remember. There's something to the effect of we can only have Tabor elections. It's either in even numbered years or the odd numbered years. I just can't remember which it is. And I wonder whether Michael uh, Davies, if he's monitoring the call, uh, might recall that. Or Doug, if you've heard that at some point uh, in the discussions, because I think that will obviously impact our timing because we're too late to go to the, by far to go to the ballot this year. And the question is, can we go next year or would we be compelled to go to 2024 in order to have something kick in in 2025, which would be when we would want it to kick in because that's when the deep roosting does. So enough of that. I see general counsel is perhaps prepared to respond. So I'll shut up. Thank you. And, and uh, Melanie Snyder, general counsel Snyder, do we know that from the, the wording of the uh, amendment? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So Tabor does provide that ballot issues have to be decided in a state general election or on the a biennial local district election or on the first Tuesday in November of odd number years. So you could proceed in an even even year state general election. There's one there is one limitation in RTD's organic statute though that deals with sales tax increases. And so uh, this would not apply to, to de debrucing situations, but if we were seeking to ask the voters to increase the sales tax, that can only be done in an odd year under our organic statute. Okay. Thank you. Director Tistel, anything else? Okay, Director Catlin. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not necessarily advocating for this because I know there's been a lot of um, consternation about the state legislature authorizing fees for transportation. But I know that um, Director um, Broom had suggested that at one point, I believe, exploring the option of fees. Did you want to, um, Director Broom, would you like to explain what your intent with that comment was? Um, no, I need to refresh my memory. Well, my apologies. I thought it was you who brought that up, um, you know, exploring the option of fees in lieu of, uh, as another revenue source. So, um, I just didn't, didn't know if anybody else had. Well, yeah, I, I guess what I'm struggling with here is, um, are we going to do that in this committee or... Is that something for a different committee? 
perhaps I just know that the that the discussion of additional revenue sources that that had been brought up. So that was under the context that I brought that up. Okay, well, yeah, I I'm really interested in taking a look at at the possibility of of uh, imposing a, some fees, just like uh, CDOT's done, you know, instead of sitting around and doing nothing, the, of course, they're in court. And so we'll find out whether all that works out or not. But a lot of the fee stuff that has gone to court, like Colorado Springs, uh, the, the Colorado Supreme Court upheld their transportation fee, uh, but then they got cold feet and didn't impose it. And so I don't know if, if there's any other cities in, um, we'd have to ask CML that have, you know, done that um, and impose some kind of a transportation fee. There's transportation fees like in, I think it was Overland Park, Kansas, uh, that was put in and it's based on the uh, uh, zoning of individual lots. Uh, and the fact that, you know, if you're a shopping center, you're gonna have a lot of traffic you're going to pay really high fees. If you're a, a vacant residential lot, you're going to pay practically nothing, um, it, you know, in, the, in those fee schemes. But we need to do some real research into that and find out what's out there and see if any of them might fit for RTD. Dr. Patlin, anything else there? <laughs> I don't see any other hands, so I'd have to ask a couple of questions myself. Um, on slide number... Chantel has yeah. her hand up. Sorry? Who does? Chantel, forgive me. I see Sean. Director Lewis, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I, you, I just had one question as Director Broom was, was chatting and listening to the discussion of the other folks um, on the call. Can you all let me know what it is that we are kind of hoping that we accomplish at the end of, of these sessions um, and the direction that we're going? Is it to explore what our options might be or is it to give some guidance to staff? I just wanna make sure that I'm engaged in the right way in these discussions. I can respond in part. Okay. Um, Director or, or Chair um, Music had asked our group to provide recommendations to the board with regard to a, a debrucing ballot initiative. And um, we also in sort of a organizational meeting realized that this question of fees or, and or property tax or other things might come up in conjunction with discussions about it, either among our group, our board, or with stakeholders or the state, for example. So. Um, uh, I think the idea is for us to evaluate the possibility of a ballot initiative for debrucing and to make recommendations about it, about its provisions if we go ahead, um, the terms, when we do it, um, what it might encompass, is it permanent or temporary, et cetera. Is, is that the sort of thing you're getting at, uh, Director Lewis? That's exactly what I'm getting at. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, anything else? Nope, that's it. Oh, forgive me. Director Broom, your hands up. Well, let me take it down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Director Geisinger. So uh, is that saying that we're that in this process, we're not going to look at other options for, um, you know, diversifying revenue sources or combining the, the uh, two or whatever other, other options there may be out there? I'll just offer from my standpoint that we're not precluding that, that in fact, our charge was to evaluate the possibility of an initiative, but that initiative might encompass these other approaches as well, mm -hmm. is what I understood it to be. It might not be a single thing. Are we gonna go to the voters or not? It might include some other provisions or, at, or actions that we might take, including a program to diversify our revenues is, is my take. Anybody else? Any? Other thought on that, Dr. Director Broom or GMCEO or, okay. Lynn, Director Geisker? Uh, no, I think, yeah, if we're gonna look at, uh, at these options, we ought to just consider, you know, all of our options at this point. Thanks. Um, on one screen, if I may, I'll go ahead if I'm not missing somebody again. Um, you had mentioned that uh, debrucing was temporarily lifting 
the Tabor restrictions. Is that is that all we can do? I think I've heard of other entities that have permanently debruced, at least to some aspects. Um, just to clarify, Doug McLeod, is that true? Yes, I, I believe that's the case. I, I believe Director Tisdale indicated that some have been permanently debruced. General Counsel Snyder, do you? I think that's more of a legal area. That, would you like to opine on that? Yeah, I think the answer is yes. We could ask the voters to do that. Okay. Um, I like the idea that was suggested of getting uh, the actual text of the amendment out. That would be helpful, I think. Um, can we talk a little bit more about the strategic communications um, piece and, and just see if I understand where we're talking about going with that. It's both a, you know, a sound people out about what they'd like to see us do in this arena and then to uh, flesh out a strategy for carrying that's some idea, as Director Tisdale talked about, once we have an idea of the direction we're going, carrying that and the necessary background information out to the various constituencies. Is that what you're talking about, uh, uh, GM CEO Johnson? Thank you very much, Director Cook, for the uh, clarifying question. So I would say, contingent upon what this group decides to do and puts forward as a re recommendation to the board, that would be the basic objective overarchingly to help determine what that strategic plan or strategic communications plan would consist of. Um, to answer your question more pointedly, I would say yes, that would be the intent because one needs to take the temperature. And I'm offering this up just from my past experience um, in different geographic areas, but I always found that to be advantageous before you're actually going out to poll because you need to garner where the appetite is. And so that's what I would offer up. You all need to do your due diligence relative to what you all want us to do collectively as staff supporting this effort. And we can ensure we're working in tandem with you, but need that clarification to develop that actual strategy and clarify what the objective is. Did that help? Did I answer your question? It does. Um, I wondered to uh, Director Rivera Malpietti and others, Director Tisdale, whoever, Director Lewis, um, I think you and others perhaps have weighed in on this piece of connecting with the community and um, and then forming a strategy that encompasses both that piece, but also carries us forward as we begin to develop a plan mm -hmm. of recommendations. Does that sound right? For me, it's absolutely correct. I think we need to know what we're putting forward uh, to the community before. I, I don't wanna get out into the community and uh, go, what do you guys think and tell us? I, I think that, we are the experts. We are the ones who are sitting day to day in this agency with the expertise of our team, our, G, our CEO and our, and our staff to take recommendations to the community to kind of decipher. And I agree with many of the board members talking about, we are at a unique time where climate change has totally taken over conversations in terms of importance affordable housing and transportation has bubbled to the top. It's no longer its own industry piece. It is the backbone to so many issues that are affecting the community. And whatever we do, I think we need to be very thoughtful and strategic before we start including community. So not going out uh, to take their temperature per se about a specific approach. Uh, I'm just trying to get at that piece. Are we going to go out? I just, uh -huh. I think, I think we need to have our ducks in a row of what we want to present and then let them tell us if we're on the right track or not. But I, I think going out with the, with the blank slate would, would not be good because I think everybody has a different opinion. Okay. Um, so general manager, CEO Johnson, could you bring us how you'd see that unfolding as part of what you're offering as a communication strategy there. So Director Cook, if I could ask for some clarification so I can manage expectations, when you talk about bringing something to you, you're talking about, you know, a white paper, a position paper, a conceptual document. Are you talking about a strategy? Are we looking to leverage, you know, pollsters? I'm just trying to get a broader understanding of what it is uh, in yeah. reference to the request you put forward in all fairness. Yeah, uh, Director Tisdale talked about getting a little bit further down the road here, just not going out without any kind of structure or idea, but having some sense um, of, of where we might go. Maybe even it's an alternative or two, um, not just one thing. 
Um, am I paraphrasing correctly, Director Tisdale? Um, uh, thank, you. thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, if I can, just let me jump in for a little bit here. Um, <clears throat> clearly, tomorrow night, people are going to start talking about this because when we hear from leads uh, and we know what's going on, at some point, the conversation may turn to, well, what's RTD going to do about this? And at some point, someone's going to recognize that our debrucing of six tenths of our total sales tax is going to go away in just uh, effectively two years. And if that's the case, what are you going to do about it? So I think we need to be prepared to say, in light of the fact that the base sales tax will no longer be debruced effective as of 2025, we have to start considering alternatives and we are exploring that process. That can be the initial message so that people don't think we're trying to play hide the ball and so we demonstrate we're doing something. But then I think we need to say, okay, and those alternatives include just debruce that maybe combine it with fast tracks and at the same time seek to debruce the entire thing into the future beyond 2050 even. Uh, maybe to explore the possibility of at least thinking about perhaps imposing a property tax and so on. So we start putting a, a, a cafeteria out for people. But the first message I think is clear, and that's a message we're sending today to whomever listens to this or watches this, and that is that six tenths of our sales tax will no longer be debruced in effectively two years. What are we going to do about it? Okay, that kind of gets at Director Williams's initial point too. Um, so crafting that initial message and then the the message when we're down the road a little bit, having identified some potential avenues to explore or that we are exploring and taking the temperature of the community um, accordingly. Does that work? Uh, Deborah Johnson, you're up there. Yes, thank you. All I'm trying to clarify because in one instance, we're talking about a communications plan and in another instance, we're talking about a strategy. So when I was basically asking the question about managing expectations. I understand that first we have to come up with the objectives, but I'm when you asked me, could I put something together? I was seeking clarity around, is it actually a conceptual strategy or, and now it sounds like we're talking about a communications plan. So I just wanna be uh, clear in what's being requested of staff because I wanna ensure that I am providing you uh, with the deliverables that you are seeking. But right now I'm still confused because these are two different things that I have heard throughout the course of this dialogue. And the way you describe a plan sounds uh, more in line with what I'm hearing from the directors. And that would be, uh, you know, identifying the, the initial message, creating the sense of, um, I don't know, urgency is not the right word, but understanding of the, the nearness of the situation we may, we may be facing um, and what the implications might be. And then, um, you know, we've, even today started to talk about diversifying our revenue base, trying to get some sense from people in the next stage of that plan uh, for where there might be some support. Does that sound right? Um, okay, so we're actually talking about a potential implementation strategy and not a communications plan because once we decide on what that is then we'll develop and i'm sorry you're talking to somebody who did government relations and community relations and when i think about a communications plan it's something different so i may be uh, making too much out of this but i think i understand what we're talking about just a broad brush concept and then we can talk about how we go from there as we look at targeted audiences and what the objectives are so thank you for indulging and, and for indulging my misuse of terms director geisinger uh, um, I appreciate. It. I think that's. Uh, I think that Ms. Johnson's summary was was uh, well put. That we need to move forward with sort of a strategic view. Uh, you know, uh, given what uh, Director Tisdale was quoting about how many people have done this, and given that Jefferson County is the most recent that tried and didn't do it, and I think maybe trying, planning to try again. There's a lot of knowledge out there and uh, a lot of that we can tap into. I'm sure there are lots of consultants and county commissioners. So um, a next step uh, for 
whomever the committee or the staff or, or whatever would be potentially to, to uh, um, start looking at lessons learned from from some of our our uh, ju partner jurisdictions. I'm Director Broom. Yeah, I, you know, I envisioned at the very beginning that we would be uh, reviewing and studying this for four or five months. I don't want to get into a situation where it's ready, fire, aim. You know, that, that doesn't serve us well at all. If we're going to go out, we have to have a plan when we go out. Uh, it's okay to discuss maybe in generalities with people you know, but um, at this point, we just don't have a product to sell. And I think that's what I've been hearing too. Um, this initial message is just sort of a problem statement, if I can understand it. Um, and so we're just making that statement available for the public to consider as we develop an understanding and begin to refine what might be approaches or possibilities. Um, Director Catlin. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I think that Doug's slide, the graph that showed um, revenues that we had versus what could have happened had the ratchet effect taken place um, if we hadn't debruised. I think that's very illustrative. And I just think that's a good, um, a good place to start with communication for people. I mean, this is in, in the years that have happened since 2009, you know, we would have been Six hundred million dollars less in revenue, and think of the services that would not have been provided had we been in that situation. I just think that's a really good um, graph, and it simplifies things. Uh, I'm worried that this option of maybe combining this six tenths and four tenths into one would really confuse voters because most people do not even understand that we have two different financing systems base and fast tracks. And I just think it would complicate things. Thank you. Some thoughts about that initial statement. Um, Director Broom? You're, you're good. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. Is that helpful at all? Or shall we have just some subsequent discussion, uh, GM CEO Johnson and Doug McLeod? So for all intents and purposes, Director Cook, what I've garnered from the conversation and the, and the comments that Director Broom put for it is basically, you know, a position paper. And, and that's what I look at it as at this juncture. And I see some head nods from other people. So we can, you know, go forward with that in light of the discussion. And it's, it's, it's just a position in the sense of being loose as we decide, because I agree with Dr. Dr. Broom, Director Broom, from our initial, uh, or he's laughing, organizing meeting as we talked in generalities, what is it we're trying to solve for? And I agree. That's why I was asking for clarity because we need to work this through. And I too surmise as we were having conversations, that this is something where we're going to ensure we're taking the temperature, but doing it in um, a deliberate fashion where we don't cut off our noses to spite our faces. So yes, that's my long-winded answer to say, yes, that makes sense. <laughs> okay. All right. If you have thoughts, folks, uh, for what else might be brought forward on May 9, this is going to be our second finance session. Um, please send those to either Director Broom or I or the staff. And, um, and, then, uh, and then maybe we could talk too about uh, the position statement or the problem statement or what, whatever we're going to call that. So is there... Uh, any other matter to come before this meeting? We're about 10 minutes over here. I want to get us out reasonably close to on time. Director Broom, you, you, you have something? Yeah, one request. I'd like staff to get a hold of the National League of Cities and ask them about transportation fees and, and what information they may have on any of their members that have imposed transportation fees. Okay, staff, can you do that? Yes, we will work with um, National League of Cities. Okay. And also NACTO might be a good one as well because referencing where we are, um, you know, I, I would just offer that up as well. Okay, trying to see if there's anything else that people have brought up. Um, Director Tisdale talked about uh, bringing forward scenarios 
the 7% CPI um, that might carry us for you for you years might impact our timing. I thought that was a good point. Um, Director Lewis, wondering whether or not to reimagine. Will we have to reimagine folks at our next meeting? Is that something where if they're talking about changing the way the district looks or anything that might impact some of this going forward, we'd be able to ask them, uh, Doug McLeod? I have a meeting with them tomorrow and, and I'm not sure what stage they're in and preparing that information. So if I could check with them and, and uh, we'll schedule them if they have something appropriate. Of course. Okay, and um, I think that's good. Um, so unless there's anything else to bring up under other manners, I'd go ahead and just note the next meeting date again, Monday, May 9 at 3 p.m. and um, see if we can adjourn. Um, any, uh, any objections to adjourning? And I'll go ahead and do that at 4.12 p.m. Thank you all very much. Appreciate your thinking on this. Thanks. Take care. Thank you very much.